Hey, it's not like I'm everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Oh, it's my pen ringing. Praise belongs to Allah. We praise him and we ask him for guidance and forgiveness. And we seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our actions. Whom Allah guides, no one can lead them astray. And whom Allah makes astray, no one can lead them back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no deity but Allah alone with no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the servant and messenger of Allah. You who believe, be mindful of God, as is his due, and make sure you devote yourselves to him to your dying moment. Believers, be mindful of God, speak in a direct fashion and to good purpose, and he will put your deeds right for you and forgive you your sins. Whoever obeys God and his messenger will truly achieve a great triumph. So again, assalamu alaikum, my dear sisters and brothers. Alhamdulillah, again, we are able to uh, meet here together um, with the health and the ability to do so that is granted by God. Um, it's been a couple of months, but inshallah, we're going to pick up uh, from the story of Musa, alayhi salam, where we left off last time. Um, when Musa was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and away from the oppression of Pharaoh. And as we recall, they, they left under the cover of darkness, carrying only their meager possessions, uh, heading towards the desert, heading across the desert towards the Red Sea. And when they reached the sea, the Pharaoh's army was pursuing them closely. And the people uh, with Musa could see the dust, you know, getting stirred up by the, the approaching army. Uh, and they looked out to sea in front of them and felt trapped. And by the will and permission of God, Musa struck the sea with his staff and the sea parted, revealing a pathway. So the children of Israel walked across the seabed. And when that last person had crossed uh, safely, the sea fell back into place and drowned the army of Egypt, including the tyrannical Pharaoh. Um, and the children of Israel, you know, these were people that were so accustomed to be, to, you know, being an oppressed people. They had been oppressed and, humi and humiliated uh, for generations, right, over this really long period of time. Um, so for just several generations, they lived under that yoke of Pharaoh um, to the point that they had become almost, you know, belligerent people always expecting the worst, always longing for a slice of the good things in this world. Uh, and, and their sense of honor and self-confidence had, had totally been eroded. And during their journey out of Egypt to, you know, towards the promised land, there was ample opportunity for their character flaws to become obvious, unfortunately. The children of Israel very quickly became uh, ungrateful to God, despite the, the care and attention that God had afforded them. They were incapable of behaving submissively and accepting the will of God, which was a little ironic because they were submissive under the tyranny of a Pharaoh, more or less. Um, and so as they're, they're trudging along, they come across a people and they witness these people are worshiping idols and their eagerness to be like those people um, was apparent. They they looked at these people and perceived them to be happy. Um, and they asked Musa to let them have an idol, completely forgetting the miracles uh, of God that they had just witnessed. And when God provided them delicious food, which was till then unknown to them, they complained. They want they wanted that inferior food that they were used to. Um, and and Musa, when he directed them to march into a town, and overthrow the Canaanites, they refused, mostly out of fear. Uh, and thus, they disobeyed the command of God. Ibn Kathir narrates that Musa was able to find only two men willing to fight. And in the Quran, Allah um, tells this story, this bit of the story in Surah Al-Ma'idah. And so it says, Moses said to his people, my people, remember God's blessing on you how he raised prophets among you and appointed kings for you and gave you what he has not given to any other people. My people go into the Holy Land, which God has ordained for you. Do not turn back or you will be the losers. And they said, Moses, there is a fearsome people in this land. We will not go there until they leave. If they leave, then we'll enter. And yet two men whom God had blessed among those who were afraid so were afraid said, Go in them through the gate, 
And when you go in, you will, you will overcome them. If you're true believers, put trust in God. Uh, they said, Moses, we will never enter while they are still there. So you and your Lord go in and fight them and we will stay here. Moses said, Lord, I have authority over no one except myself and my brother. Judge between the two of us and these disobedient people. And God responded by saying, the land is forbidden to them for 40 years. They will wander the earth aimlessly. Do not grieve over those who disobey. So verses uh, 20 through 26, and so it's a Ma'ida. Now, Khaled Abu Fadl explains that the Israelites were commanded to enter the Holy Land and basically overthrow the tyrants who ruled the land in order to establish an order of justice and fairness. However, the Israelites were not up to that challenge. They would actually prefer to turn their backs to God's command and return to an existence of submissiveness and moral pacifism. Both the Bible and the Quran agree that God was so dismayed at the moral cowardice of a people who were led from subjugation to freedom that instead of rising to the moral challenge, they actually craved subjugation again because that was an easy way out. You know, I mean, just that in and of itself is, is um, quite profound. And he explains um, this, that the reason of this revelation um, was also talking to the Muslims uh, at that time uh, in, in, in uh, Arabia. It related to what they were enduring. Um, and so both, again, the Bible and the Quran agree that God punishes those people, allowing them to remain in a state of loss and instability, uh, both being a moral loss and a physical loss. A loss. In other words, uh, God lifts the hand of support and says, you know what, you're on your own. You had my support and now you're on your own. So thus began the days of wandering, where each day was like the one before. The people traveled with no destination in mind. And remember, these are children, the, the children of Israel um, are, are a people not used to this sort of nomadic desert life, right? These, these were city dwellers. They, uh, so this was um, an incredibly uncomfortable time for them. And eventually through their wandering, they entered the Sinai, uh, where Musa recognized that it was the place where he had spoken to God um, before his great journey into Egypt had begun. And, and God ordered Musa to fast as a as purification for 30 days and then added 10 more days. After the fast was completed, Musa was ready to once again communicate with God. Um, and Surah Al-Araf uh, speaks of this, of this, um, this encounter where the Quran says, we appointed 30 days from, for Moses, then added 10 more. The term set by his Lord was completed in 40 nights. Moses said to his brother Aaron, take my place among my people. Act rightly and do not follow the way of those who spread corruption. When Moses came for the appointment and his Lord spoke to him, he said, my Lord, show yourself to me. Let me see you. He said, you will never see me. God said, you will never see me. But look at that mountain. If it remains standing firm, you will see me. And when his Lord revealed himself to the mountain, he made it crumble. And Moses fell down unconscious. When he recovered, he said, glory be to you. To you, I turn in repentance. I am the first to believe. Mo uh, Allah says, Moses, I have raised you above other people by giving you my messages and speaking to you. Hold on to what I've given you. Be one of those who give thanks. We inscribed everything for him in the tablets, which taught and explained everything, saying, hold on to them firmly and urge your people to hold fast to their excellent teachings. I will show you the end of those who rebel. So again, Surah um, Al-Araf, uh, verses 142 to 145. Okay, so God gives Musa two stone tablets and written upon them were the believed to be the Ten Commandments. Um, and, and, you know, and, and we know that in, um, in uh, 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 Christianity and Judaism, but these commandments um, form the basis of Jewish law, okay, the Torah. And they are uh, standards of morality set by the Christian churches. Okay, and, and here they are revealed in, in the Quran as well. Uh, Ibn Kathir uh, and the early scholars of Islam stated that the biblical 10 commandments are, re are reiterated in two verses from the Quran. 
Okay. So this is um, Surat al-Anam uh, verses 151 and 152. So I want to I really want to uh, focus on this. So Allah says in the Quran, say, come, I will tell you what your Lord has really forbidden you. Do not ascribe anything as a partner to him. Be good to your parents. Do not kill your children in fear of poverty. We will provide for you and for them. Stay, stay well away from committing obscenities, whether openly or in secret. Do not take the life God has made sacred except by right. This is what he commands you to do. Perhaps you will use your reason. Stay well away from the property of or orphans except with the best intentions until they come of age. Give full measure and weight according to justice. We do not burden any soul with more than it can bear. When you speak, be just. Even if, if it concerns a relative, keep any promises you make in God's name. This is what he commands you to do so that you may take heed. So in Musa's absence, he was absent for 40 days, his, his people became restless. Uh, they were like children complaining and acting impulsively. Ibn Kathir describes their descent into the unforgivable sin of idolatry. Um, and he mentions a man who was inclined toward evil suggested that they find themselves another guide as Musa had broken his promise. He said to them, in order to find true guidance, you need a God and I shall provide one for you. And so he collected their gold jewelry and melted it down. During the casting, he threw in a handful of dust, acting like a magician to impress the, uh, the ignorant. And from the molten metal, he fashioned a golden calf. It was hollow, and when wind passed through, it produced a sound. It was as if they had succeeded in making themselves a living God. And Musa's brother Aaron had been afraid to stand up to the people. When he saw the idol and realized what a grave sin was being committed, he spoke up. He reminded the people to worship God alone, and he warned them of dire consequences uh, for their actions, both from Musa and um, on his return and from God himself. Those who remained true to their faith, to, sorry, those who remained true to their belief in one God separated themselves from the idol worshipers. And when Musa, Musa returned to his people, he saw them singing and dancing around a golden calf, and he was furious. Um, uh, I want to pause here for just a moment. I say the saying of mine, I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah, walhamdulillahi, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the name of God, in the name of Allah, and, uh, and exaltations be to Allah, and blessings and peace be upon the messenger of Allah. So, uh, you know, there's a lot in, in this section of Musa's story that we could discuss and expand upon. But what, what I want to kind of focus on um, in this next part uh, are the verses related to the, you know, the Ten Commandments. Um, and so let's go over... Uh, what Allah has laid out in the two verses from Surah Al-Anam. Al -Anam. Okay, so one, do not ascribe anything as a partner to, to Allah. Okay, that was the first commandment. Number two, be good to your parents. Treat them well. Number three, do not kill your children out of poverty. Number four, stay away from committing obscenities, whether open or in secret. Number five, do not kill the soul, which Allah has forbidden to be killed, except um, by what is legal or what is, except for justice. Number six, stay away from the property of orphans. Number seven, give full measure weight and weight according to justice. In other words, um, in your business dealings, in your transactions, in, in any sort of interaction, um, ensure that you are being truthful. Uh, number eight, when you speak, be just, even if it concerns your own relative. Stand up for justice, even if it goes against a relative. Number nine, keep any promises you make in God's name. And number 10, if you stay on the straight path of Allah uh, and you do not follow any ways that will lead you astray. Okay, so those are, are the 10 commandments that are mentioned in the Quran. And Allah includes in those verses uh, he says, this is 
what he commands of you. Perhaps you will use your reason. Okay, so what Allah has laid out is a moral code of ethics, a compass to point us in the right direction, the direction of the straight path. And this is the core of what Islam is, right? This is laid out here. It is, if you notice, it is justice. It's not dogma, okay? Morality, not simply ritual. Nowhere in those 10 commandments does it say, and I'm not, I'm not downplaying ritual, okay? Ritual is incredibly important but it is useless if you aren't upholding a moral, ethical code and behavior. So what these verses are talking about is morality. And striving to meet these commandments will build our personal and communal virtues. Okay, it's this give and take relationship. If we strive to uphold this moral code, this moral code of conduct, then we will instill in ourselves good virtues. And if we focus on our good virtues, then it will be easier to uphold these commandments. And this back and forth symbiotic relationship is what Allah is, is um, pushing us towards. Um, and, and unfortunately, we have seen numerous times when that focus is shifted um, away from what is truly pious, what piety is made up of, and, and instead is centered on the rituals, okay, at the expense of ignoring that moral code. I just need to get through these rituals. I'm not going to even think about what that moral code is. Um, and when that happens, we start to see these evil characteristics um, begin to emerge. <clears throat> A few weeks ago, some of you may have heard about this, a quite horrendous incident um, came out within the Muslim community, the American Muslim community. Um, you know, it's a, there was a certain teacher, a widely well-known Quran teacher who um, got into some huge trouble. I mean, I, I can't even describe how horrendous this is without getting into the details. And I don't want to get into the details, but the basics are that a very well-known and prominent Quran teacher uh, was arrested for conspiracy to produce child pornography. I mean, this is absolutely horrible. Um, and if you have read the affidavit, the details um, that are contained in it are, are just absolutely jarring to say the least. Here is a man, popular, very well respected in the American Muslim community who has made a name for himself teaching Quran, teaching memorization, and yet he is partaking in uh, a most heinous act. And you're like, how can this be? How can people who make their career and purpose teaching Islam and the Quran engage in a practice of such extreme obscenities? And you know, there are numerous factors that lead a person down a path of extreme sin. Even if that person is uh, an Islamic scholar or an imam, but I, I personally believe that it boils down to an unbalance of personal and community vices and virtues. So this, this I'll explain it in a bit. So when our moral compass gets all wacky, okay, very quickly, our ability to understand and uphold our virtues will diminish. And so what do I mean by this, vices and virtues? In Christian tradition, there is a concept of the seven virtues that counter the seven sins, chastity over lust, patience over wrath, faith over idolatry. Um, and a few years ago in a helica um, led by Sheikh Yasser Fazaga in formerly of Austin, he explained this very beautifully. He said that between two vices is a virtue. So for instance, being miserly is a vice. Being a spendthrift is a vice, but in the middle is generosity. Okay, another example. Being prideful is a vice. Having, you know, uh, being self-loathing is a vice. And in the middle is humility. And that's what we have to balance, right? Because we all have this tendency to 
shift towards one vice or another. But the goal is to find that, that middle point, to focus on the virtue and instill that in our behavior. Um, and when um, we lose that balance, either as an individual or as a community, we will quickly slide down that slope to one vice or the other. It's a very, very, very slippery slope. And I remember when the story first came out and we were discussing this, how could this happen? How could this happen? And I, you know, the reality is this happens because we allow certain vices to exist. We have, like all communities, when we elevate certain people to such prominence, we are elevating them for not always the best reasons or not always the most healthy reasons. If we are a community that upholds systems of patriarchy, systems of misogyny, even if it's just a little bit, it will quickly become a slippery slope down a very nasty path, right? So it is absolutely incumbent on all of us on an individual level and on a communal level that we identify the various vices in ourselves and in our community. And we push ourselves and you know communally and individually to shift away from those vices and head more towards a balance of, of virtuous behavior. So you can't be a little sexist, a little racist, and expect to just sort of stay there. You have to combat that. You have to combat that vice. And when you are getting, um, when you are getting recognized or applauded for engaging in those vices, that's going to steamroll your path towards that sin, right? It's going to drive you away from maintaining that virtue. Again, both individually and communally. We have to hold each other accountable for upholding our virtues. Um, and, and lastly, um, I want to draw one example. You know, we know in our tradition, uh, Allah didn't come right out and say, hey, get rid of all your bad habits. No drinking, none of you. Put it up, put it down right now. You're not allowed to drink. We know that this came um, in, in bits and pieces, right? Allah uh, revealed certain commandments, oftentimes in bits and pieces, to push us along, to make it easier to adopt, right? Okay, don't go to the mosque drunk. And, and then it, you know, the, eventually became, you know, first you were allowed to drink, then you were like, don't go, don't go to the mosque drunk. And then it was, don't drink at all, right? Because Allah knows even just a little bit of that sin is going to lead us to a, to a very dangerous path. And so that is where we have to recognize a little bit of a sin is never tolerable in a community, in our leaders. We have to hold them accountable. That's not to say that they have to be infallible, that they have to be absolutely perfect. But there are certain things we can't let slide, Right, And so when we allow our imams and our teachers and our scholars um, to uphold a system of patriarchy and misogyny, this is what we are going to get. We are going to get predatory behavior from these people, okay? They're not inherently bad, but we've created a system and we've upheld a system that allows them to indulge in their vices. And we have to be better than that. We have to create a community that is better than that. And we have to hold those that sin accountable in a very just manner. And if you look back at those 10 commandments and then you look at this incident that happened with this, with this imam, it becomes quite apparent just how many of those sins were committed, how many of those 10 commandments were violated, right? They didn't, they didn't kill a child. If you know the story, of what happened. A child wasn't killed, but a child's childhood was killed. That child will never be, have that innocence of childhood anymore. That's a sin, right? You've indulged in obscenities openly and secretly. That's a sin. What's interesting is there was also a commandment that was upheld and it must be recognized because the strength that it took to uphold that 
knowing what could follow is truly noble. The person that called out um, this, you know, the, this behavior was this teacher's own wife. So she stood up for justice. She sought out justice, even if it was against her own spouse. And that act, as much as it can affect her in her personal life, could also save who knows how many other children, who knows how many other women. So again, as a community, as an individual, we must not allow ourselves to indulge in vices that can lead us down a path of sin. And we have to recognize that just a little bit of sin is never, should never be acceptable. And we need to do better. O oh Allah, please accept our good deeds and our good intentions, forgive our shortcomings and our missteps, and allow us to experience many more moments together. O oh Allah, grant us the good things in this world and the good things in the next life, and save us from the punishment of the hellfire. Allah, oh Allah, aid us in accepting the tests and tribulations of this life, and give us the strength to overcome any challenge we may face. O oh Allah, rid us of our fear, anxiety, despair, and sorrow, and replace in us a sense of serenity, tranquility, and hope. O oh Allah, we ask that you place peace and solace in the hearts of those suffering any injustices. O oh Allah, instill in us the ability to uphold and maintain virtues that are pleasing to you. O oh Allah, we hope for your mercy. Do not leave us to ourselves, even for the blinking of an eye. Correct each of our affairs for us. There is none worthy of worship but you. If I have said anything of truth, it is from Allah alone, and my gratitude goes to Allah. And if I have said anything that was not of truth, then that is from my own ego, and I ask for forgiveness from that transgression.